Hello, and my name is Pete Rushmer, and I'm your host today of A Half Dozen Things podcast. A Half Dozen Things is a podcast for business owners just like you. Whether you're an underdog hungry for success, or you're already smashing it, but want to continue to level up, we are here each week for you to get insight and learning from the very best in the business. No fluff, no BS, and no self-proclaimed gurus talking about how easy business or life is. Hi, I'm joined today by David Summers. David is the founder of Road Skills Online, which is a CPD platform for drivers, and I've been working closely with him recently. I'm absolutely delighted to have him on the podcast today. He's got over 30 years in experience in the transport sector in all different types of guises as well, and he's a real expert on risk management, compliance, and driver training. So I'm really pleased for him to join me. I hope you have a, a really enjoyed this podcast. Take care. Catch you soon. So I've just had a lady tell me that we're recording in progress and the red light's rolling. I'm joined today by David Summers from Road Skills. I'm absolutely delighted to have David on the on the show today. Um, he's a chartered fellow of the Institute of Logistics and Transport, and I'm at, you know absolutely chuffed to have you here, David. Um, just for the benefit of uh, my listeners who may not have come across you, obviously we're going to tell them later to make sure they uh, they join you on LinkedIn and, and, and connect with you and what have you. Are you able to just give you give a bit of a background around your background in the transport sector, David? And obviously you're uh, very passionate about it as well. So <laughs> yeah. that'd be great. Thank you. Um, in, the, in the transport sector, Pete, I think I got into transport not by accident, but not with great intention, like so many people. I was in the army. I had the great good fortune to do a short service commission in the Prince of Wales's own regiment of Yorkshire. And uh, when that was coming to an end, I thought, what shall I do? And uh, the notion came to me on a mo- an autobahn in Germany. Oh, I'll get into the transport business. <laughs> so that's what I did. I came out. I was a self-employed agency driver for about six or eight months. And then then I bought a unit and became an owner driver. That's amazing, uh, amazing. So you've you've sort of been through the whole spectrum and uh, obviously as an owner driver, did you did you expand the fleet at all or did you, did you continue as yourself for the time being, David? Yeah, as the owner driver and a little bit afterwards, you know, Saturday mornings were spent lying under the truck, checking this, checking that. And in those days, even with European trucks, you needed to go around with the grease gun and find all the nipples, know that you'd greased every moving part that needed to be greased, because uh, that's how they were, that was the, the standard of the manufacture then. Um, changing the oil, changing the filters, you know, I had, had my army overalls, they all came in handy. Uh, and then, yeah, I think we built up at, at one time to about 16, 17 vehicles running. Yeah, so I was an operator, did run trucks. I had to find drivers and uh, I had to um, motivate them and incentivize them to do a great job. Excellent. So you've got full empathy with uh, certainly listeners at the moment who are busy trying to recruit drivers and find good people to work for them in a very, very tough marketplace. Um, you can certainly empathize with those, uh, those business owners at the moment who are trying to run their fleet safely and efficiently as well. I certainly can, and all the communication issues, you know, drivers are remote workers, um, and most of their working time, they're operating independently. So it is a challenge to help every driver to do what you want them to do, the way you want them to do it, and uh, it's a big job, yeah. Yeah, perfect, perfect. And uh, in today's podcast for listeners, we're going to be talking about the ways that we can improve profit and whilst reducing stress of running that transport operation as well, which I think is a really, really great way. Um, I've not even influenced that at all. That that was totally uh, totally, uh, yourself, David. So I'm really looking forward to getting into those areas. And just for the listeners, some of the things we're going to talk about is how to cut the cost of diesel. Uh, We're going to understand a bit more about the O-license undertakings, uh, insurance costs and collisions, uh, as well as involving drivers in the work we're doing. We're going to talk a bit about bridge strikes, and then we're going to talk about the evidence uh, 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 towards the end as well. So, should we jump straight into it, David? Then, so, um, so in the in uh, the title of the the podcast, we're going to be looking at improving profit and reducing stress. Are you able to just tell me a little bit about why you wanted to do those things? Well, again, in my own experience running trucks, 
um, I realized one day that we were, I had a, quite an expensive education, a, a management education. Um, and I, I realized um, as we were growing that I wasn't using um, those experiences and capabilities across the board of performance. We were using it to organize our daily operations, yes, but we weren't using it to control as much as we could the P&L. And, um, you know, profit is the difference between what you take in and what you take out, as everybody knows. And if you can cut what goes out, yep. um, then that helps your profit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, diesel has been, you know, the, the, the cost of diesel to a business has been something Holliers have talked about certainly ever since I was in the industry and that, uh, you know, Road Haulage Association annual conferences in Tenerife, it came up, RHA Scotland annual weekend conference in Peebles, it was always on the agenda. Um, but it, it, I, I thought, well, what, what is there to do about it? How do you cut the cost of diesel? And, and diesel has um, two numbers. One is the cost it at the point of use and one is the price at the point of purchase pretty much we don't have very much control over the price at the point of purchase but can we exercise more control over the cost at the point of use and the answer is yes i would say again based on everything i say is not only forged from my own personal experience as an operator but working with hundreds of companies and probably thousands of managers and drivers over the years since. And I, as a ballpark figure, I would say that the majority of drivers could save something on any operator's fuel bill as of tomorrow, really. Um, and people do measure now. I mean, when I was starting to do this myself, and we're talking 30 years ago, Pete, I knew operators who'd got 50, 100, 150 trucks, and they weren't even keeping my upper gallon figures. So their fuel cost was almost an unknown, unmanaged quantity. Mm -hmm. um, today, you get many, many more measure, monitor, give feedback to drivers. Um, feedback needs to be more than posting it on the notice board. And um, it's the same with telematics. Again, my, my surveys of companies I work with um, have shown that so many companies today have telematics, but it's finding the time to monitor the telematics and do something about the performance uh, is the difficulty. As we said earlier, drivers are remote workers, but also the management teams in transport fleets are busy people. There's a lot to do, and it's, it's definitely not an overstaffed industry. Um, Absolutely not. I mean, I have, I do have a methodology uh, for achieving um, a reduction in the cost of diesel across the fleet. And if anyone wants to contact me, you know, they're, they're welcome to do so. And I'll share it with them. Amazing. Amazing. I, I yeah. think uh, I'd, I'd like to take that one offline and uh, and have a bit more insight into that. That sounds, yeah, uh, yeah. That sounds, that sounds amazing. I think, um, you yeah, know, I, I, I learned early in business from, uh, Actually, he was the owner of uh, of the body repair centre I worked for, and we had a recovery operation as well. And his old saying around profit and profitability, and it's a little bit self indulgent for me to share because I love the anecdote. Uh, but he used to walk around, walk this twenty year old me or mid twenty year old me around the workshop where the guys were working. He goes, "Do you know what the secret to good business is, Pete?" And I was like, "No, I don't really. Is it? Is you know what? What is it?" And he goes, "Well, you need to eat like a sparrow and shit like a pigeon." <laughs> <laughs> and i think that's absolutely you know that's absolutely brilliant and um i love yeah, sharing that absolutely. one because it was it was such yeah. a fascinating character as well um real real old school real old school and uh yeah I, I learned so much from him but it's absolutely true you know the i work with quite a few sort of family sized uh, or family operators and actually fuel consumption isn't monitored to the extent that it could be because it kind of falls in the too hard box. Um, it can be very tricky to do. Drivers can be particularly um, 
you know, that they, they can find it potentially offensive if the conversation is not, not discussed in the right way as well. So approaching that as well. But I've also seen examples where I know operators who do it really, really well and they measure it by spreadsheet. Um, they actually set, they, they measured and recorded a fleet average several years ago, which was the fleet average fuel consumption. And then um, they essentially benchmarked, which is a really good way of doing it. So this is the benchmark across the fleet. And they understand that the different vehicles in the fleet, because there's different manufacturers and vehicles, their, their potential will be different for fuel yes. consumption. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they, they benchmarked those as well. And what they then did is they said, right, we're going to invest in we're going to invest in a load of training we're going to have some uh, sort of fuel efficiency uh, training and then what we're going to do is as we measure the benefit to the business of the fuel consumption improvement we're going to spend a third uh, is going to go towards profits for for us and for for you a third of it's going to go for driver bonuses and a third of it will be reinvested into further training in the future which i thought was quite a quite a good way of doing it and actually they've got an enviable fuel consumption figure of um certainly 13 miles per gallon something like that which is which is very good around certainly the lincolnshire area which is about an hour before you hit a dual carriageway yeah uh, in any direction so um so yeah no very, very impressed with that no that's brilliant so a great offer from yourself for people to reach out and speak to you about your uh fuel consumption methodology um that's 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 brilliant okay. by the way it doesn't involve paying out for training <laughs> you can do okay. it all yourself or you could get you know your your clients for example you could give them a little bit of help to put it into place yeah, yeah. no perfect that sounds that uh, sounds really good yeah. so uh i'll definitely be following up on that uh so okay. the sec second area that we were going to talk about was the olas that's undertaken um, oh, yeah. so tell me a bit more about that david and, and what you'd like to share there okay um little anecdote from a many years ago when I was the self-employed agency driver. There was a, a, a distribution company called Archibald who was part of the ocean group at the time, which was a big organisation at the time in transport. Um, and I turned up six o'clock one summer's morning to you know, report for, for duty and was shown out to my vehicle by the transport manager and I proceeded to do a daily vehicle check. <laughs> he, said, he said, what are you doing? So I'm checking the vehicle for its roadworthy aspects. Oh, none of the lads bother with doing that. You know, just crack off. <laughs> anyway, times have changed. And uh, yeah, I think I'll just read out here, if I may, Pete. A quote from the O-Licence undertaking yes, that all really. new operators have signed since 2011 when this undertaking came in. I understand that by signing the application, I am accepting the undertakings below, that they will be recorded on the licence, that failure to comply with the conditions or undertakings recorded on the licence may result in the licence being revoked, suspended or curtailed, and that failure to comply with these conditions is also a criminal offence. Now, I'm not sure how many operators appreciate that, but everybody who's filled in a GV79 or its online equivalent since 2011 has signed that declaration. That's, that's the first thing I'd like to bring to everybody's attention. And the second thing is the first item of the undertakings. And it says, all the laws relating to the driving and operation of vehicles used under this license are observed. Now, I've not come across many companies in the hundreds I've worked with who've actually done an analysis of what those laws are and they've actually then analysed what they need to do to comply with those laws, because it's a sort of custom and practice idea of, well, we need to maintain our vehicles every six weeks. Drivers need to do a daily vehicle check. And I'm also finding evidence now that when people go online for the daily vehicle check, they're making an assumption that it's done because it's electronic. Whereas... With, with the old paper pads, 
they could see that pad if drivers weren't doing it properly they could see that but equally if the, if it was a perfect pad with ticks in every box that's not to say the driver's done the check that's something i would just invite people to watch out for um the third thing is why is it so few people know about those two items that i've just read out and the reason is that the undertaking that comes back to the operator with the o license isn't either doesn't have any of that in it the traffic commissioners still send back the 1995 original undertaking now why i'm not exactly sure i have investigated and i've talked to the previous senior traffic commissioner and the office manager but no real answer was forthcoming, but it's an anomaly, isn't it? It's is an anomaly. If the goes to look at their O license, they're looking at an out-of-date document, not the one they signed. So again, I'd recommend here, Pete, everybody has a look at the undertaking that they signed when they either applied for their license or when they did their five-year renewal, because that's the one they've committed to. Again... Yeah. If anybody wanted um, a copy, I actually, for one client about five years ago, you know how everybody's around policies and procedures these days, you know, policies for this, policies for that. Well, I wrote a, a policy statement for complying with a no license. So again, if anybody would like a copy of that policy statement, and it's got the, it's got headline procedures in it, then by all means, contact me and I'll happily share it with anyone. Another another fantastic offer, David. Thank you. I think um, there's a um, there's a chap on one of the Facebook transport manager groups um, that uh, that prepares and binds copies of the uh, maintaining roadworthiness and he copies and uh, binds the uh, the O license undertakings and and what have you as well. But uh, which I, I you know I recommend I recommend having a chat chat with him as well i think it's tom reddy that does it uh, who's a fantastic chap and has been on the podcast actually recently. oh yeah i heard i heard uh, some of tom's yeah uh, top, podcast with you top, the other day the other week, was yeah. A, yeah he was an hgv hero top top chap he is yeah, too yeah, um yeah. uh yeah but uh I had no idea, actually. I'd, I'd, I'd not picked up on that. I don't know whether that shows my lack of due diligence. That I'd not realised what I signed and what was returned were were two different documents. So there we go. That's me showing a little bit of humility there. Thank you. I've learned something, okay. which is amazing, which is great. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't suppose many people have picked up on this, David, right? No, I don't know anyone. I mean, I even the, even the leading transport solicitors in the country, when I put it to them, of, of not actually being able to say, oh, yeah, we know that. Oh, no, amazing. I think particularly when you you mentioned around, I, I made a note here, you mentioned around daily checks and making sure they were being done and knowing they were being done properly. Um, there, there, there are a few things that, that can be done. I, I quite like the online system in comparison to the paper systems. I, being a millennial, I do, I do prefer yeah. them. Um, and I like that I have the asset list and then I can look at the assets that don't have a check against them. But this is something that transport managers should be doing on a very regular basis. Uh, and that is, you know, what assets do I have? What assets are out? And what haven't got a daily check been recorded on them today? Because that means it may have been done locally on the on the phone or the tablet that you provide the driver, but it's not reached the, you know, it's not reached the cloud yet to reach the, yeah. reach the main system. So we need to have a conversation around that. And then also... You know, I think one of the things that I've picked up, particularly through doing fours with people and seeing the fours being picked up, but also looking at some of the recent public inquiries is, are those defects that are being picked up at a six weekly or however regular your inspection cycle is, are they driver reportables? Mm -hmm. Are you checking that against your driver reported defects? Because that's that's a very quick way to, to pick up. If you, Obviously, you can do gate checks and things like that as well. But um, that that's a quick way to pick up. Actually, are we getting defects? And and should the driver have reported that that tire is low? Should they have reported that that loss of air? Should they have reported that? Mm. You know. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah, absolutely. Um, it's um, is it. I highly recommend the supervisory check. I mean, 
I've, I've got hundreds of anecdotes from situations over the years, but so, somehow when, when you're chatting, they don't always come to mind at the right moment, but one just has. And um, it's about doing supervisory checks that drivers are actually doing their checks. And what I recommend to all my clients is that um, for every 10 to 20 vehicles they operate, do one random check each month and a completely random and go round the check again with the driver. Yeah. Now, especially these days, Pete, that's helping the driver because DVSA can bang a fixed penalty of hundreds of pounds on a driver on the roadside now. Yeah. It's not just a question of a paperwork exercise and getting a letter about it. You know, the driver stands to lose out. And as we know, up until very recently, they've not been the best paid people for what they do. No. So doing a supervisory check on drivers to motivate them to do their daily checks effectively is actually something you're doing to help them, to support them as their manager and incentivize them to recognize that if, this, if you get picked up on the roadside, you could end up with a hundred quid fine just like that because that's how the examiner interprets it. I remember years ago, one of my drivers, uh, Mick, this, this chap was Mick Fish. I had three Micks, actually, um, in my regular core. And um, Mick, I used, he was a good driver. He was, a, he was our leading driver. And, and Mick said to me one day, he said, I'll tell you what, boss. When you're in the office at half past six or even earlier sometimes on a Monday morning, that doesn't half, half make a difference with, with the lads checking their vehicles. You can see lights going on and off all up and down the yard. <laughs> oh, he's in, I better check my vehicle, you know. Amazing. Uh, yeah, like, you're like, uh, you know, stories are great. For, I love that one about the, the uh, sparrow and the pigeon, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Har Harvey was a top chap. Um, okay, Brill. So let's move on to the third area, which was insurance costs post collision. So I think the way you've worded that alludes that collisions are going to happen, right? So what can we do about it? Is that is that the direction you're heading, David? Yeah, um, that's the starting point, Pete. Um, collision We've got, we're heading in the direction that c collisions do happen, but they don't have to happen. Mm -hmm. So are we doing everything we can as an operator? And again, time is a factor here. Getting time to talk. Over the last 20 years, since we've been in mainly in consultancy, piece of the biggest feedback I've had from hundreds of operators isn't that what we offer them isn't any good. It's, it's that what we offer them some of that requires them to talk to their drivers and that's a problem because getting face-to-face -face time with drivers isn't easy as we all know but a little tip for everybody is you don't have to talk to all the drivers all the time about everything if you talk to i believe in the grapevine feet and i know it works i did some work for one of the major supermarkets oh 20 odd years ago and when they were beginning to look at managing drivers through training and monitoring. Um, and um, it, it's a question of the, the, the technique I handed over to their uh, trainer at, at a local distribution center in Yorkshire was, if you can only get three drivers talking about something, others will hear of it because the grapevine chatters and if you put good thoughts into the grapevine, they'll spread, you know, and that's just a little tip. If that helps anybody oh, get over the hurdle of, well, I'd love to do that, but finding the time to talk to all the drivers about all of it often, you know, just won't work. And I agree. Oh, and I perfectly understand that. Just pick two or three, talk to them about something. And then the next month, get another two or three and talk to them about something. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's what I call it's, the the pod system. Yeah, it's a it's a tough part of the job, isn't it? Catching up with yeah. drivers face to face, and uh, I like I like your point there because um, yeah, the, the the word does get round, doesn't it? Word does yeah. get round yeah. uh, round the team. So yeah, brilliant, 
Brilliant. Okay. Was there anything else you wanted to share well, around insurance? Yeah. Yeah. A couple of points that might help people. And then I'll finish off with another anecdote, which built my experience on this with the driver is that if we compare our industry, our transport industry with rail or air, the response to collisions is completely different. It's almost as if, well, these things happen, we have to get back on with it. And we all understand that, particularly now with the driver and vehicle shortage. Um, and it might s seem more efficient to do that, but it's really well worth trying to find a little bit of time to talk to the driver about what could have been done to prevent. In other words, to learn from the incident um, and how, how all drivers could, could avoid that happening uh, in the future and discuss it in a positive way uh, as a learning experience rather than um, rather than you know we're, we're exploring to pin the blame a little bit more and this came out a long time ago when I had Nick Bradley who had a big 120 cubic meter drawbar outfit and when the M20 was being widened from its original two-lane motorway um, had a, a coming together, shall we say, with a lady in a car who was pushing her way onto the slip road and he was using my vehicle as a mobile barricade to stop her getting in. Anyway, in the toing and froing, he ended up hitting her because she pushed in front of him. So from an insurance point of view, it was our fault. But I asked Mick to come and see me at the end of a week and said, you know, Mick, what could you have done to avoid it? And it wasn't my fault. She shouldn't have been pushing in. <laughs> I said, OK, let's leave the fault issue behind. But what could you have done to avoid it? Anyway, he wasn't having any of it. So I said, OK, we'll pick it up next week. And over the next couple of months, this is how long it took, I probably saw Mick four or five times for five minutes each time. And I just asked him the same question. Mick, what could you have done to avoid it? And eventually there's a knock on my door one Friday afternoon late on. You got a minute, boss? Yeah, come in, Mick. He said, I'm not saying it was my fault, but if I'd let her in, none of this would have happened. Now, I wasn't exactly sure whether he meant having to see me four or five times over the last couple of months or the actual collision. But clearly from Mick's development after that, he got, he got it, that it was about avoiding situations rather than being in the right. And by the way, a little tip for everybody is, in road traffic law in this country, nobody has the right of way. Okay. <laughs> That's perplexed me a little bit because people do have the right of way, right? <laughs> no, no. It isn't enshrined in law. So if you think about all our signage, we're invited to stop or to give way and if we're invited to give way to oncoming traffic, it doesn't say they have the right of way, it says the oncoming traffic has priority. Or if you are the other way, you have priority, but you don't have the right of way. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting educated here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna grab my highway code back out and reread it uh, well i hope i'm not i hope i'm not coming across too boring feet with these little <laughs> nuggets but you know it is the thing about it isn't it isn't whether it's correct in law or in the highway code or anything it's the state of mind that it it instills in people of so if you're talking about avoiding collisions and you have a state of mind that says i'm in the right of way yeah. And that's not going to be an avoiding collision mentality, is it? No, 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 absolutely. It's in a bullshit. This is my bit of road. Get out of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember when I lived in Germany, there was um, there was a little anecdote that went something like, um, there's many a dead German driver who had the right of way. I like that. Because they do have well, the I right don't like of way. It. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, great insights on collisions there. Great insights on road safety as well. Absolutely love that. Um, let's move on to the fourth area then, David, around involving drivers and making them a part of your business. Talk to me a bit more about why that's important, David. Okay. Um, if you involve your drivers, you have a much better relationship with them. Let's start with that, really. And they have a much better relationship with you. 
And something I've picked up over the years in, in some of the companies I've, I've worked with and worked for is, um, is, is about, tr and, and there are those around who, who've got a good profile at the moment. It's about being a place where people want to work. Yeah, and absolutely. that makes that would that makes life easier for all the management in such a company. But it doesn't happen by accident. Yeah, you know, you've got to initially work. It's like getting any train going, isn't it? Needs needs a lot of coal or fuel to get cracking. But once it's up to speed, it cruises along efficiently. Um, the other side of the coin is, you know, the the legal requirement. HSE do say that all businesses must inform, instruct, train and supervise their employees in any aspect of the work that has risk attached to it. So there's no denying that driving a vehicle and getting on and off the vehicle and loading and unloading a vehicle has risk attached to it. Yeah, absolutely. But are, are those workers being informed, instructed, trained and supervised consistently and continually? Not just at induction, you know, filling them up with stuff at induction, most of which in three weeks is forgotten. The old Ebbinghouse curve tells us that. <laughs> and um, and again, do it do it bit by bit. It's not that you've got to do stuff with all the drivers all the time about everything. You just keep um, nudging nudging it in in the conversations. Um, I actually picked that notion up way back in my army days, reading uh, General Bill Slim's um, anecdotes in in, um, in the book Serve to Lead. Uh, and he used to visit troops. You know, as the commander of the British Army in Burma, he had to send man, men into battle. And uh, he used to go around, visit, visit the regiments and battalions and talk to soldiers, um, knowing that, next morning they were going into battle and the tip he, he used was that he talked to the soldiers for a minute maybe and 55 seconds of that minute was about the soldiers and their conditions and red cross parcels and socks and what have you and then just near the end he'd get his motivational comment in and that's a great way to talk to drivers as well yeah i love that um you know the different techniques, again, if anybody wants any techniques, you know, we, we don't have time to go into all the detail today. Um, but all, also, by the way, uh, just come, come to mind, just recently, in the last month, HSE have updated their website, and they've made a clear, it's in my Tuesday uh, top tip post this week. I think yeah. you read it, Pete. Um, the HSE have announced that Op operators must apply the same management support to the risks involved out on the road, driving a vehicle and working on and off a vehicle, as they would to somebody working in the workshop on a machine or or, or some other equipment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, and I, I find that regularly. That that's very a very interesting thing, David. I think I commented on the on the post as well. I find with a lot of the operators I work with, there's really robust safety systems in place for anything that's on site because it's perceived as the responsibility of the business um where where the work is undertaken on the prem on the premises of the operator uh but actually there's there's certainly less potentially less care or uh potentially the right word is uh it's a little less robust because it's a moving feast right for the activity of the driver on others premises um, however, still being responsible to the operator themselves. It's absolutely okay. that it's absolutely one of the risky when we talk about risk, one of the riskiest roles I would say there is being a yeah. being a professional yeah. HGV driver. Yeah, I don't want to frighten the industry about about how risky it is, but the stats bear that out, you know. Um the other the other thing that occurs to me is that um there was an anecdote. Back in July, I think it was, I saw a driver from a perfectly decent uh, family-based operator with, you know, a big fleet, and they're good people, and they've worked hard for 50 years to build that business up. They're good, decent, classic, absolutely good, decent transport people. 
but the driver was on his handheld mobile phone. Now, what is it that makes that allows that driver to think that it's okay to do that? Yeah. Whereas in their workshop, one of their fitters, to use your comparison, one of their fitters wouldn't take a mobile phone call while they were tightening wheel nuts up with an electro electronic um, um, uh, thing. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> it's come out of my head. You know, they wouldn't, would they? They wouldn't no, carry absolutely. on tightening wheel nuts up while they took a phone call. Absolutely. One of one of the things that so I I come from a safety background as well as as just doing sort of transport consultancy and one of the things I find really interesting is in in the predominantly safety only sector where we multiple industries but where they talk about safety they talk about what's called safety differently and cultural safety and and that people fundamentally no individual fun, fundamentally goes out to either hurt themselves hurt anyone else or do a shit job. You know, fundamentally, people are good people, whether they're yeah. HGV drivers, whether they're transport managers, what have you. But th this involving drivers comes back to the crux of it is actually what is the culture of your business? And yeah. culture is something you can't touch and feel, but you see happening. And also what environment have you got which causes someone to actually pick up the phone whilst they're driving and think that's okay. Have they yeah. not been trained that it's unsafe to do so? Or have you created some kind of push factor as a business to actually encourage them to pick the phone up because they're afraid of doing a shit job by not answering it, for yeah. example, may be the case. Uh, it's, it's quite a complex, it's quite a complex thing to consider. And, and in all cases, it will be different depending on the business. In all cases, it will be different. Agreed. Yeah. Right. But yeah. I think, uh, like, like, like we were alluding to before, one of the hardest things to do is to speak to drivers. One of the hardest things to do is to have drivers together, and and involving them is a uh, is, is 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 absolutely vital. Which I think is leading us nicely on to where we're going to be at the end of the conversation. But ultimately, having having drivers together as regularly as possible will ultimately improve. And and like you say, making sure that there's that motivational element of we really care. We're going to spend the majority of our conversation talking about the challenges you're facing and trying to overcome those challenges and overcome the environment that you face and the challenges. Um, and at the same time, we're going to instill a little bit of education to ensure we understand what's a safe practice and what isn't. Because when you do something day in, day out, it becomes taken for granted. So maybe you don't really recognize the different hazards that, that you're yeah, facing as well. Yeah. If nothing's gone wrong, then it leads to a, a detachment from the potential yeah. for it going yeah. wrong. And, yeah. and we're all in vehicles which cut us off from the sensory information that actually tells us what danger we're in. So you know, modern trucks are like modern cars. They're windproof, soundproof, weatherproof, warm, comfy seat, air suspension. Whereas, you know, you could be going along any road and 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 the 30, 30 miles an hour feels slow in a, in the town yeah. or many many um uh, roads that are going you know the main roads yeah. um but if you were going along that road at 30 miles an hour on a bicycle you know lycra shorts on and everything else how would it feel 30 miles an hour would feel very fast yeah absolutely and that's the truth yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I think I sort of the, the point I'd like to reiterate is that the absence of accidents or the absence of collisions doesn't necessarily mean a safe environment. No. You know, and that that or, or, or even the lack of historic accidents doesn't necessarily mean no. a safe environment either. I think uh, I think those are the things. OK, Brill. And actually, it brings us really nicely onto bridge strikes, because actually those two things come in really, really nicely, yeah. because you you as an operator may never have struck a bridge, but that doesn't mean you're not going to tomorrow. If you have right. the right the right management systems in place, so yeah, talk. Obviously, bridge strikes is a big thing at the moment. The traffic commissioner is absolutely hammering hammering through for operators. And I saw, I think you posted about this actually, maybe the other week. Was that right, David? Uh, around did. bridge strikes. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah talk, talk to me a bit more about bridge strikes, David. Well, along with shortage of drivers, it's it's one of the hot topics at the moment, coming from a different direction in the business i.e. the authorities are pushing it, the traffic commissioners are put, pushing it, and net, that's because Network Rail have appealed to the traffic commissioners for help with that. Um, just yesterday, uh, I, I, I attended a Backhouse Jones webinar, 
and, and James Backhouse was saying, you know, the, the traffic commissioners do expect operators to engage with drivers and discuss the prevention of these issues, as well as review whether it could have been avoided and, and had they done everything that, that could have been done to prevent it happening and find out why it happens. Interestingly as well, James also brought our attention to a fact which most of us will recognise is that if any of us make a mistake, we tend then to do things differently based on the experience of the mistake. If we're talked at or to by somebody encouraging us through training not to make the mistake that others do, that tends to fade away. And again, the Ebbinghaus effect confirms that. But, but, but James was advising, and it was, it's a reasonable point, I think, you, you know, your thoughts would be interesting, that a driver who's had a bridge strike is probably a lot less likely to have one again, which actually links very well with your thought that because you've not had any doesn't mean to say you're not going to have any. Yeah, absolutely. And it, 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 it and you make a really valid point. I was having exactly this conversation around not bridge strikes, but I had to deal with recently, uh, and and uh, I shan't say who he belonged to or anything like that, but a driver didn't couple a trailer correctly, probably, mm -hmm. and it ended up on its knees. And yeah. uh, we investigated it and we were discussing it. And obviously, as part of that becomes a disciplinary and, and, and what have you. And, I, and my point of view was, right, hang hang on a minute. Because of all the people and all of our driving teams, who's the least likely person now that he's been retrained, gone through the embarrassment, had the alcohol and drug test, been through the whole rigmarole, who's the person least likely to drop a trailer now? And 100% is that guy, right? 100%. Yeah. And it's the same yeah. same from a bridge strike point of view as well, isn't it? Um, yeah. But but the tendency would be, well, you know, historically would be, well, gross, you know, gross negligence or what have you, sack him, uh, get rid of him, which obviously we can't do in the current six climate. So I'm not saying we condone those things, but we've also got to look at a better way of managing managing how that's happened and, and preventing it from happening in the first place. Historically, every generation develops the quality of life, the standard of living, the way we do things, the efficiency of the way we do things by looking at what the previous generation did and improving on it. So that doesn't mean to say everything has been done. And I, when I say generation, I mean something like every 10 years. That doesn't mean everything that's been done in the past was wrong. It just means that people haven't developed the new thoughts. And, and it's the same with every, every other incident. If you look at incidents as an opportunity to learn and improve uh, rather than um, the discipline or dismiss, then it will be better for that culture development. Absolutely, yeah. So um, again, a, a safe, a safety one aspect that I sometimes joke about with some of my safety colleagues is um, blame, shame, retrain. <laughs> yeah, get a bit in first. We're very good at that. We're yeah. very good at transport. Yeah. Blame, shame, and retrain, rather than yeah. looking at rather than looking at the environmental <laughs> factors which potentially yeah. can cause these things to happen. For example, why is somebody rushing? Why have they not paid attention? Why do they feel like they need to get that job done so quickly? Why do they, you know, why are they taking that route? Why, you know, have they got the equipment they need? Have they got the right, you know, has the planning been done correctly, et cetera, et cetera. And anyway, I, no, that's probably... I just mention at that point, you won't mind yes. me mentioning it, not at all. our Bridge Strike e-learning module is available free for the whole industry. So... Anyone who wants that bridge strike module just has to go to us and register, and um, and we'll, we'll they send us a list of their drivers, and we'll get them uh, we'll get them um, uh, subscribe because uh, uh, we'll get them onto the system and send them the module. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely yeah. perfect. Um, I think it's a great opportunity as well. It's a it's a great one. It's on it's on my to do list to get it done very soon myself uh, to have a look yeah. at the e learning. I can't. I love I love the road skills e learnings as they come through. So um, yeah. I think we'll just move on. In the interest of time, we're going to move on to the last yeah. point, which is yeah. number six, uh, the half dozen thing, which is evidence. Talk to me a bit yeah. more about evidence, David. Okay, it's easy to be going along in everyday life um, and and the, the the subject of recording what doing what you ought to do, but doing the right thing and making sure you record it can be overlooked. 
and then something goes wrong and you start scratching around for evidence. Um, so anything that you do that is about risk management, compliance, safety, and even the fuel economy, the evidence is absolutely paramount because we are in a risk-based business sector. And if things go wrong, you need all the evidence that you can get. And uh, thinking on to um, you know, the, the close of our conversation today, Pete, because it validates the learning and it motivates the, a driver or a, and a transport manager to actually pay attention to the learning so that they can get through the quiz and move on to the next one. Telematics dashboards, um, you know, there's evidence there, for example, but if you're not using that evidence to tackle the issues that the evidence is portraying, then that is negative evidence. So Sorry. from a point of view of investigations and potential prosecutions, once those processes start, you know, the the investigators are looking to bring a prosecution. I mean, that's what they're there for, isn't it? So you need your evidence already in existence. It's too late to create it after the event. Yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. I think um, it's something that um, we've we've introduced recently that we um, that we do, and that's like when when we do work with our clients and they can then use it as evidence. We do site visit reports, everything that's been yeah. done, everything that's been yeah. done proactively, and it's a it's a great it's a great uh, use rather than just going a day spent here well what have you done <laughs> you know what's yeah. actually gone on what's happened and also life's busy right so it's hard to remember everything as well post uh posthumously so um yeah it's vital to make sure that we proactively record everything that we're doing um david i've thoroughly enjoyed sharing a few anecdotes and having a good chat yeah. about the sector with you it's been it's been great fun and um I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to have you have you on the show um David's going to tell you all listeners in a moment a bit more about road skills, which is how I got to know David. Um, if you are interested in road skills um, and once David has explained what it is, then please do reach out to either of us. Mention that you heard about it on the podcast because David then knows that, that you know, as a, as a tool, this has worked. Um, listening to us and speaking to us, you know, mention, mention, uh, uh, men mention the podcast, let, let him know that that's where that's come from. And uh, yeah. you're always welcome to a free, you know, we offer a free trial. We can run you through it, et cetera. Um, but David, please do for the, you know, for the benefit of the listeners, please explain to them exactly what road skills is and how it can help their transport business. We both mentioned our experience, Pete, that the, one of the biggest difficulties for um, communicating with drivers is getting face-to-face -face time. And that's, that's the issue we've solved. That's what we set out to solve. Um, my feedback, your feedback has come from hundreds, if not more operators who said that is a problem for them. So a few years ago, my colleague Susie said, why don't we just get everything we know and see if we can get it into an online program? So we formed a uh, uh, business with a um, software developer and we have put all the content, everything you would want a driver to know to operate safely, legally, be compliant, look after their own health, lifestyle, fitness and uh, welfare um, is in the programme. It's continuous professional development. It's accredited with CPD standards office. Um, and it's a module a month, taking no more than 15 to 20 minutes to complete. That includes a quiz, which uh, a five question quiz at random. And the dashboards tell a manager uh, exactly where every driver is in, in, the, in the development, in the program. And see at a glance who's done which modules right down to the second they did them. A certificate is issued, so recognition and reward uh, concept for every module pass and every 12 modules um three hours of uh, four hours of professional continuous professional development accreditation is awarded on the certificate um and um you know you can't have too much evidence and, and this is great evidence that drivers are involved 
in a professional development program to do the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. So as you say, you know, anyone who's listening, contact Pete, put us in touch, and um, we'd be glad to show you the program. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like, like we say, there there are free modules available. So go go and try the bridge. Get, get in touch and try the bridge strikes modules. Yeah. The, mm-hmm. the 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 quality of the training is fantastic. Um, the uh, the the user experience is great. You you know some of the concerns that I've come across when I've been speaking to operators will be about will the drivers be able to use it and engage with it. It's so easy to use. It's so easy to engage with. Uh, part of the part of the offer is that we help roll it out. We'll help ensure that the drivers um, are able to use the system. But it's so so easy and simple. Anyone who's got you know one of these will will be able to engage with the content and be able to use it. And it's all nicely recorded and uh and, and like i say the transport manager the operation will have a dashboard they'll be able to see who's done it who hasn't done it and it's such a great proactive way of demonstrating uh how you're compliant with the operator license undertaking how you are proactively preventing bridge strikes how you are evidencing what you're doing and how you are involving drivers it, it literally you know it, all, all the things that you've heard david and i talk about over the past near near on an hour um is covered by by road skills and and the varying uh, 36 online courses that are there available uh, for you on a monthly basis and and it's very easily accessible and cost effective as well it really is so yeah get in touch and have a chat david it's been an absolute pleasure us uh, catching up i really really appreciate it for those of you that uh, have seen David here, please do connect with him on LinkedIn. Each Tuesday he shares a great tip um, as well about the transport sector and uh, your experience is vast and phenomenal. So thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure, David. Me too, Pete. Thank you very much. And, take care. Uh, I hope everyone's got something out of it. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, take care. It's been absolutely amazing. And for listeners, if you've enjoyed it, if you want to share any of the insights, please do tag us in. Um, you know, share it with your friends and and hopefully we can reach more people, help more people and help make sure that we make the road safer ultimately and uh, and make sure that the transport sector is a better sector for everyone involved, for drivers through to transport operators as well. Thank you very much. Take care. I really hope you loved today's episode. And if you did, please make sure you subscribe and listen out for future episodes too. Please do share it across your social media channels. We hope to reach more and help more people. If you want to find out more about me, my name's Pete Rushmer. You'll find me across any social media channel and my business, Flagship Partners, and we're your partners in success across your business. Thank you. See you again soon.